This particular lesson, New Testament conversion, in and of itself, is not one of the studies that we do. Of course, if someone is a non-believer in Jesus, we're going to start with what book in the Bible? John. We're going to start with the book of John. If someone believes in Jesus, what study do you want to start with? And then we go to? Word. And then we go? Then we go? And then we go? Amen. Now, even though this is the next study in our book, this really is a study to help reinforce your convictions Amen. about New Testament conversion. Because after light and darkness, ordinarily would come the cross study, which we will do next Wednesday. Now, after saying this, there is a sort of a study that I have to give you from studying the major conversions. And I've used this study when people have gone through all the studies, they know everything, but they still won't quite make the decision. Oh, man. And so this is a good one to have in reserve, if you see what I'm saying. Yeah. It's also an excellent way for us to grasp quickly the major conversions. Amen? Amen. So, most of these scriptures we've either gone over or at least are somewhat familiar with, and so we'll be able to go fairly rapidly through them this evening. Amen? Let's start with the conversion of the 3,000, the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2. In each of these major conversions, which we're going to study out the conversion of the 3,000, the Ethiopian eunuch, the Philippian jailer and his family, and Paul, in these major conversions, we're going to ask ourselves four questions. Number one, what was preached? Number two, what was the person's response to the message? Number three, how long did it take the person to make the decision? And number four, what was their response after baptism? That's pretty cut and dry right there, amen? Let's go to Acts, chapter 2, verse 36. Right here, Peter is concluding the first gospel sermon. And he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you've crucified both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all of whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves this corrupt generation. Those who accept this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Now, a little admonition for all of us. You know, sometimes when you go over a scripture many times, it can start to lose impact. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need to understand, this is the historical record of God's church. Yeah. And when we read these scriptures, I mean, it, there should be an electricity that runs through our veins. Just thinking about 3,000 people being baptized in one day. Amen? Amen. I mean, it'd be awesome just one person baptized. Are you with me right here, guys? Yeah. But 3,000, you know, Lord willing, this Sunday afternoon at Bible Talk Leaders Meeting, Susan's going to be baptized. Does that fire you on up? Yeah. That's going to be great. That's going to be awesome. And, and then we're fired up about one person coming to the Lord. Can you imagine 3,000? Okay, now, this is the conversion of 3,000. Let's answer our four questions. First of all, what was preached? Well, right here we see what was preached in verse 36. It was Jesus, in particular, whom you crucified. That was what was preached. Very simplistic message. Amen? Amen. Well, number two, what was the person's response to the message? Well, in verse 37 it says they're cut to the heart. But at the end of the day, in verse 41, it says what? They were baptized. Well, that's a pretty good response, amen. amen. Number three. How long did it take the people to make this decision? Less than a day. Less than a day. Now, remember what we're trying to use this study for. These are the people that just won't let go and have faith to become a disciple. You with me right here? Yeah. And number four. What was their response after baptism? 
Well, we have to read down a little bit further for that. Look at verse 42. They devoted themselves, the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking bread, and the prayer. Everyone was filled with all many wonders, miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions of good, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Wow. Well, right here, we find what was their response? At well, they were devoted. Amen. And number two, they were happy. It says they all ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Now, that's pretty easy, right there, guys? Okay, now, you want to move through this whole study fairly quickly. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. Let's look at our four questions as we read our text. Beginning in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. And Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he is deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Now, put your finger right there. Right. And when you're studying with a person, have them put their finger right there. Now, remember, this person has gone through all the studies. And so you'd ask them, if this is Poncho that you're asking, say, okay, Let's pretend you're Philip, and you're talking, and we'll just have uh, myself kind of be the, the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, tell me the good news about Jesus. What, what are you going to share with me? What, what, what would you share, guys? Jesus came. Well, Jesus came. Lived a perfect life. Lived a perfect life. What else? Died yeah. For your, Jesus, died for your sins. Jesus died for your sins. What else? He resurrected. That's a good one. Amen. At the end of it all, when you tell someone the good news about Jesus, you got to tell, hey, how you get the good news, and you're going to talk about repentance and baptism, are you not? Yeah. Yes. That would be what would make it good news. Okay, now, look what happens. Verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Now, this is very interesting. You see... He just tells them the good news about Jesus, and the next thing in conversation is what? Baptism. Baptism. And why is he so fired up that he sees water? Because he wants to be baptized. Well, he wants desert. to be baptized. Desert. But he's in the middle of a desert. Whoa. And if you're in the middle of the desert and you want to be baptized, you'd be fired up if you'd see water, right? Oh. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water... And Philip baptized him. When he came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went on his way what? Rejoicing. Rejoicing. Okay, let's ask our four questions here, guys. Number one, what was preached? The good news about Jesus. Number two, what was the person's response to the message? He got baptized. Number three. How long did it take the person to make a decision? Just a chariot ride. Just a chariot ride. However long that was. And what was the person's response after baptism? Rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Wow, we're starting to see some things kind of line up here, aren't we? Yeah. Okay, well, let's go to Acts chapter 16. We find right here, a rather humorous account, actually. Except it wasn't too humorous to the people it happened to. <laughs> oh, amen. Is, in particular, right here we find in Philippi, that uh, there was a slave girl in the city that was following Paul around. And she just kind of trailed behind him, and, 
And she starts saying, these are the men, are the servants of the Most High God. They'll tell you the way to be saved. Now, at first, that seems like, wow, this is awesome. But what if you wanted to share your faith and you have someone like that trailing you? <laughs> you know, and the Bible says, you know, and let's face it, our brother Paul was not perfect, was he? No. Well, he got a little short. He just turns around and just rebukes the demon in her, <laughs> comes out. Now, he said, well, that's awesome. So she, she's no longer demon possessed. Well, the problem is, is that she was a slave. And as a slave, she made money for her master by telling the future. And indeed, she was revealing who these men were. She knew the truth. And so when they found out that their means of making money had been taken away by this guy, Paul, were they very fired up about Paul? Okay, let's read. Verse 22. The crowd joined an attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they'd been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer commanded the guard them carefully. Upon receiving such order, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were complaining about their week. That's what's wrong. They have a wrong translation. No, guys. After being flogged, after being put in the inner cell with stocks, the Bible says at midnight, yeah, they were awake at midnight, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now let's stop right here. <laughs> Here's the situation. I mean, it's, it's, it's been one of the most intense days in Paul and Silas's life. But instead of getting down, instead of getting negative, instead of getting depressed, at midnight, they are praying and singing hymns to God. And the Bible just notes, and the prisoners were listening to them. Well, what else were they going to do? Yeah, they don't have radio. Yeah. And all of a sudden, there's this earthquake. Was that by chance? No. No, it was from God, wasn't it? Yeah. And all of a sudden, the prison was built in such a way that all of the doors start coming open. And the, the head jailer starts freaking out. Because he's now afraid that since everybody's fetters have fallen off, the doors are open, that all these prisoners are going to escape. And if the prisoners escape... What was going to be his lot? He, he was going to be tortured and killed. Was he nuts? So, in the midst of this drama right here, he literally says, it's over, it's over. I, I'm just not going to go through all the flogging, all the hassle. I'm just going to kill myself. So, he literally is taking his sword and he's about to kill himself. He's about to commit suicide right here. And Paul says, hey, hey, don't do that. We're all here. And the jailer calls for lights. He says, get the lights. Let me see that that's true. Rushed in. Fall, he falls trembling. I mean, he's scared. I mean, he's, he's just thought about taking his own life. He is literally shaking before Paul and Silas. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not talking about the spiritual question. What am I going to be saved? He's saying, what can I do to have my life spared? But our dear brother Paul, he had a spiritual answer, right? <laughs> Verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in the house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all of his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole family. Is that a cranky story or not, guys? Yeah, That's incredible. Well, let's ask our questions. Number one, what was preached? Believing Jesus in the Word of God. Well, specifically in verse 32, it says, they spoke the Word of the Lord to him. Now, a lot of people, you know, they say, well, uh, right here, he says, all you have to do to be saved is just believe in Jesus. 
Well, if you read the whole text right here, he goes on and says, okay, I got to talk to you about the word of the Lord right now. Verse 32. Do you see that? So he preaches the word of the Lord to him and the others in his house. Secondly, what was the person's response to the message? He and all of his family got baptized. Is that awesome? That's great. Number three, how long did it take for the person to make a decision? A night. A night. So well, why was he baptized at night? Because it was urgent. Because he wasn't promised the next day. He still didn't know what was going to happen to him. You know, I, I know for myself, when I came to a deep conviction that I was lost. See, I thought I was a Christian. When I came to the conviction that I was lost, I was separated from God. I really wanted to be a Christian. And I remember telling the guys after a Bible study at 10 o'clock at night, I says, I'm good to go. Amen. Of course, I blew their minds. <laughs> and so they talked to me for a couple hours. Finally, they said, I guess he's ready. <laughs> and so at 1.30 in the morning, I was baptized. Come on. Now, there are only four people there, but it was a cranking baptism. Amen. 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 <laughs> the last question. What was their response after baptism? They were filled with joy. See some consistencies coming on down right here? Amen. Amen. Now, in the next major conversion, we actually have a couple of chapters that detail Paul's conversions. Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 22. As a matter of fact, his conversion also is talked about in Acts chapter 26. But we're just going to focus in here on 9 and 22. Let's go back to Acts chapter 9. In Acts 9, is essentially Luke's account of what happens. Acts 22 is Paul's own sharing about what happens. And the interesting thing is, you'll, you'll absolutely, it's the same story, you'll see it. But it's interesting how they emphasize different things. And by putting both of these accounts together, it helps you to get the true picture of everything that happened. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So as he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus who you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but didn't see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, remember, Paul thought of himself as someone who knew the Scriptures incredibly awesome. And right here we find totally against everything that he believed in. He hears and sees Jesus. Now, do you think he believed? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I would. I don't know about you. Absolutely. But what a shock. And then when he tried to get up, the Bible says that he was blind. Was that by chance? No. No. See, God struck him blind so that Paul would see that, in fact, he was in the darkness. Do you think it was by chance he was blind for three days? No, Jesus was in the grave three days. God wanted to make an emphatic point. That's God. Amen? Verse 10. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. So you see, God is still working in other people's lives. He's going to bring Ananias into Paul's life. Amen. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. 
and he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Man. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. After taking some food, he began his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus, Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem amongst all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to see priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. Wow, is that awesome or not, guys? Yeah, it's incredible. Here he is. He's in darkness. He's totally blind. He's fasting. I mean, all he's thinking about, he has literally felt so strongly against Christianity, he has traveled all over putting men and women not only in the prison, but putting them to death. And now he's become a believer. Jesus has personally come to him and he has heard the Lord. He has seen the Lord and God has struck him blind. There's absolutely nothing else to think about but Jesus and his life. The Bible says that God also gave him a dream. At the same time, he came to another man named Ananias with a dream. And he says, hey, I want you to go share your faith with this guy, Saul. And he goes, you know, Lord, there's some problems here. Yeah. Perhaps you're not acquainted with the fact that he's like persecuting the Christians and like killing a lot of them. Yeah. And the Lord doesn't really bother to go into details. He says, Ananias, just go. Amen. Oh, amen. <laughs> I have a plan for this man's life. He is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the kings and the Gentiles and the Jews. Is that awesome, guys? Yeah. Ananias goes, lays his hands on him, he sees, and then Paul is baptized in water. Amen? Now, interestingly enough, right afterwards, right after he's baptized, he spends several days with the disciples. Pretty awesome. That's how he stays strong. And the Bible says... He doesn't wait around to start preaching. Right. I love that he part. says, at once he begins to preach the word. Now, a lot of people ask, how do I grow spiritually? How do I become strong? Yeah. Well, the Bible says right down here in verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews. Why? Because he was preaching the word. Yeah. Wow. A lot of young Christians do not grow and do not become strong because they do not preach the word at once. When you preach the word, you're going to grow strong because you're going to have some questions come back yeah. that are going to challenge you. Yeah. You don't know, and you got to dig in the Scriptures and figure them on out. On, are you with me right here? And when you figure them on out, you'll be more and more powerful in your persuasion for God. Amen. Amen. Well, that's the account of Acts 9. Let's go on over to Acts 22. We find right here that Paul's been arrested. And he's sharing his faith with a whole mob of people. And we simply read... In verse 3, then Paul said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Under Gamaliel, I was thoroughly trained in the law of our fathers, and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death. Now, this way is Christianity, right? right? Arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as also the high priest, all the council could testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus, and went there to bring these people as prisoners of Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw light, but they didn't understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go in Damascus, and there you'll be told all that you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus. Because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was the devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Now, 
already we find out that there's a little difference in what is recorded and what's been left out. He doesn't talk about the three days, does he? Yeah, no. On the other hand, he talks about Ananias, but doesn't talk about what happened to Ananias. So you see how the two, they don't contradict at all. You simply have to put them together. And so, he receives his sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. Verse 14. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one. And hear words for his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. Is that awesome there, guys? You know, the interesting thing to me, one of the greatest Christians of all time had to kind of be pushed into the waters yeah, of baptism. That's true. Yeah. So, so what are you waiting for, Paul? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, now we've got both texts that we can work from to answer our questions. Number one, what was preached? Good news of Jesus. Jesus preached Jesus. Right? <laughs> That's a pretty powerful message, amen? (laughs) Number two, what was Paul's response to the message? He got baptized. Took him three days. Took him three days. How long did it take? There you go. What was his response after baptism? At once he began to preach the word of God. Amen, guys? Do you see that? Now, let's, let's see if we can put these four accounts together just for a moment. Let's go through them. The first question was, what was preached? In Acts 2, what was preached? Well, yes, but it, Jesus Christ and Him crucified was preached. In Acts 8, what was preached? The good news of Jesus. Acts 16, the word of the Lord. And in Paul's conversion... Jesus preached Jesus. Okay, so we have consistency, amen? Number two, what was the person or people's response in Acts 2? 3,000 were baptized. In Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized. Acts 16, the jailer and his family were baptized. In Acts 22, Paul was baptized. Question number three. How long did it take the people to make the decision? Acts 2? One day. One day. One day. Acts 8? A chariot ride. Acts 16? One night. One night. One night. Paul's conversion? Three days. three days. Paul's a little slow right there. And then, what was their response after baptism? In Acts 2? They were filled with joy. They were devoted. In Acts 8? He went on his way rejoicing. Acts 16, they were filled with joy. And with Paul's conversion, at once he was out there preaching the word. He was so fired up. Now, do you see, do you see right here how this short study would be a powerful push, just like Paul needed right there at the end, as far as, hey, you know, we've been studying now for several days. We've been studying for a few weeks. Hey, Need to make a decision right here. Yep. <laughs> Look at these people. They made a decision about their entire lives in a matter of a day or chariot ride or three days. That's right. And that's the purpose of the study. Amen? Amen? Now, prayerfully, it also encourages you about New Testament conversion, right? Amen. Amen. Let's look at a couple others that are very interesting. Let's look at Acts chapter 18. In Acts 18, in verse 24, we find... An incredible man named Apollos. He becomes one of the most articulate preachers of the gospel in the first century. We read in verse 24 these words. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. Where's Alexandria, guys? It's in Egypt. Amen. There you go. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Now, let's look at what this type of guy is. He's Apollos. Now, 
let's, let's look at it. Number one, he was a learned man. Amen? He had a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He spoke with great fervor. And he taught about Jesus accurately. Though he knew only the baptism of John. Huh. And we find this one couple, Priscilla and Aquila, hears him. They say, listen, you got to come to our house. So he comes, comes to their house, and the Bible says that they explain to him the way of God more adequately or more accurately. You got it? He said, well, what what they do exactly? Well, we would just keep on reading right here. We come to chapter 19. Verse 1. Remember, the original text has no chapters and no verses. Those come a few hundred years later. They're nice and handy for us, aren't they? But this will be one continuous text. So we find this guy, Apollos, having to be instructed about the way of God more adequately, more accurately, because he knew only the baptism of John. Well, let's see if we find some any other folks that, that have this same dilemma. Verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Well, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Now stop right there. Now, we find that Paul comes across these people. And the Bible says that he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their response back was, We've never even heard their is a Holy Spirit. Because, you see, these guys were baptized before the day of Pentecost. To be baptized before the day of Pentecost, they would have been baptized in the baptism of John. Are you with me? But when was the Spirit given? On the day of Pentecost. And when was it given to people in particular? It's when they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Let's go look at it. Let's go back to Acts 2.38. It's a well-known scripture. Amen, guys? Amen. But remember, it's the first time it's ever been preached right here in Acts 2. Come on. Come on. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you receive two things. Number one is the forgiveness of sins. And number two is the Holy Spirit. So, when he finds these guys and he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He says, no, we not even heard it. He says, oh. Bottom line, he says, then what baptism? Um, automatically, he goes to the issue of baptism when he finds out they haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. So, the issue here is baptism. Amen. And they said, well, we had John's baptism. He goes, that explains it. That explains it. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Amen. Talking about the one who was to come later. That's right. And the Bible says, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, put your finger there. This is an awesome scripture because it's not uncommon. When you re really study with a religious person, they will go, well, you know, I just don't think I could be re-baptized. I mean, after all, is there any scripture in the whole Bible that talks about people getting rebaptized? And you go, funny you should ask that. Let's go over to Acts chapter 19, and then you can read it for them. Amen. You see what I'm saying here, guys? Amen. We'll talk a little bit more about this passage a little later. But bottom line, it is an excellent passage to study with super religious people, like the Apollos of the world, that still need to have New Testament baptism for forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen, guys? Amen. We'll talk about more about this in a couple classes. All right? Amen. Amen. Now, 
The rest of the evening, we're going to be dealing with refuting false doctrines. In the first part of the study, all that I'm asking you to do for the major conversions is just give me the chapters of the major conversion. So if I said uh, the Ethiopian eunuch's conversion, you would say what? Eight. Eight. Acts chapter 8. Eight. Amen. That's all that would be required. Now, uh, if I said Paul's conversion, you'd say what? Nine and twenty-two. Nine and 22. Oh, yeah. Because you see, you want to get that question right on the quiz, right? Oh. Amen. Now, in this next section, I'm asking a lot more diligence and a lot more preciseness. Yeah. This next section is going to be extremely on, valuable to you, first of all, to make sure that you're solid about what it really takes to become a true Christian. Come on. And number two, so that you can teach other people. Are you with me right here? Because people have a lot of questions. There's so much false doctrine out there. Now, we're going to review a couple things that we talked about at the end of our last class. Now, we're going to start with praying Jesus into your heart. Let's go to Revelations 3.20. Remember, I shared about this in our last class. And the verse actually says, and Jesus is talking, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now, denominational people have said, well, this is how you become a Christian. Jesus stands at the door, you knock, and he wants to come into your heart. All you need to do is just say a prayer and you become a Christian. Only problem with this is what's the context of this scripture? He's talking to the church. He's talking to people who are already Christians, who are already disciples. Now, one of the biggest things you need to get a deep conviction about in this class is that you must always read scriptures in context. Amen. You know, as, as a religious guy growing up, I used to, it, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to just say, I don't know what I'm going to study this morning in my Bible. I'd just go flip it over and go, oh, that's what I'm going to study. Yeah. Well, you know, that can be dangerous. That can be very dangerous. Can you imagine? You go, okay, God, I, I want to really study something that really applies to me today. That'll change my life. You flip open the Bible and you go right there and you go, Judas went and hanged himself. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, God, I'm sure that's not the message. I'll do another one, you know. <laughs> flip it again. You go, go and do likewise. Oh. <laughs> you flip it open again and you go, God, please, really give me a message down. You go right there. Do what you need to do and do it quickly. <laughs> I mean, it's silly, but that's what people do. You must read the scriptures in context. You want to want you got to know what it says before that scripture and after that scripture to see whether or not that scripture applies to you. Amen. Now, there's another scripture that's used talking about, quote, praying Jesus into your heart. Turn to Romans chapter 10. We'll just look at verse 9 for the moment. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if you stopped right there, you'll be thinking, well, the, okay, to be saved, all you do is just confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and you've got to believe in your heart, uh, God raised from the dead, and you'll be saved. I mean, is that not what the scripture says? That is what the scripture says. Do you believe it? No. Yes, you believe the scriptures. No. No. <laughs> no. I believe. You believe the scriptures, but you got to read them in context. Now, we got to understand just the bigger context here is very easy. Right here, Paul's addressing the unbelief of Israel. And so when you talk about the unbelief of somebody, the issue is faith. He's not, they're not ready for baptism yet. This is dealing with faith. But let's read the whole thing in context. Let's go all the way through here, beginning in verse 9. Come on. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all. And richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's the promise. 
everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But the question comes, when do we call upon the name of the Lord? Let's go back to Paul's conversion. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Remember that scripture? And now, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on His name. You know, this was the scripture that got me. This was the one. I was fighting it until, daggone it, Paul had to be baptized to have his sins forgiven. And you know, it's, it's very clear right here. If you have a good heart, it's very clear. Because right here, it's clear that Ananias is saying, hey, you need to make this decision. You've got to get baptized in water. And that's where that concept of washing your sins away comes from. It says you've got to get baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. Where do we call on the name of the Lord? It's in the waters of baptism. Amen. Do you see it? Yep. Yeah. Amen? Amen. That's right. So you need to be set. Next week, if I say, okay... Uh, someone says, pray Jesus in your heart, and they give me Romans 10, 9. All you have to do is just believe in your heart that uh, God raised the dead and you'll be saved. Just have to say, Jesus Lord. And you'll say, uh-uh, number one, you've got to read it in context. Read it all the way down to verse 13. It says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then you cross-reference that with Acts 22, 16, which says, hey, you know, right there, Paul was called upon to get baptized, wash his sins away, and that's where he called on the name of the Lord. Remember, when does a person get a personal relationship with God? When his sin is removed. When his sin is forgiven. Remember the diagram right up here? Yeah. 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 When the wall comes down, when the sin is removed, that's when you get a relationship with God. So, when do we get a relationship with God? Is it at baptism? Do you see it, guys? Amen. Amen. Let's go to the next one. We talked about this before. Infant baptism. In Colossians 2.12, we find that Paul writes words that, that, that are very straightforward and easy for us to understand. He says, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Now right here is an awesome scripture if someone says, Well, can't babies be baptized? And the Bible says you cannot participate in baptism except if it's your faith. The whole concept of infant baptism even started out with the idea that it was the parents' faith that they would raise this child in the Lord. But the Bible says it's got to be your faith in order to participate in New Testament baptism. Are you with me there? Now, After a period of time, Augustine comes on up with the concept of what's called original sin. People had started to baptize babies, so he says, well, there's got to be a reason for that. Oh, the reason is simple. Mankind is born a sinner. Adam and Eve sinned. That was the original sin, right? Right. Then their son Seth had it, and then his son, and his son, and then all the way down to us. And so they believe that we are sinners when we are born. We have the original sin. But since we all know Ezekiel 18.20, we know what the Scriptures teach right here, do we not? It's the soul that will sin that dies. Right, guys? And the Bible teaches quite clearly that the sins of the Father are not passed on to the Son. There is no original sin. Now, what is passed on to your son, your daughter? It's your sinful nature. And anybody that's a parent, you see your sinful nature in your kids. I mean, it's frightening. It's scary. (laughs) Yeah, sometimes it's magnified. Thank you. But it's there. You do inherit your parents' sinful nature. But you don't inherit their sin. Amen. Each man is accountable to God for his own sin. Are you with me right here, guys? Amen. And so, bottom line, babies cannot be baptized. Amen. There is no such thing as original sin. You have to have your own faith in order to be baptized correctly. Everybody got that? Right. 
Let's go on. Now, there's some people that will just say, be bold, and they say, well, where does it say in the Bible that baptism saves you? I mean, baptism doesn't save you. And you go, let's go over to 1 Peter chapter 3. You know, the amazing thing is, last night I, I, I went by to see someone that's been studying the Bible. And I was just going to stop by, say hello, because I really hadn't talked to him. He hadn't, didn't come to church on Sunday. And so I was a bit concerned about the situation. I just wanted to stop by and say hi. Well, it turned into an hour and a half debate on baptism. Amen. That, that's what it was about. And I literally, I mean, I thought, I was laughing to myself. It was like we were going down this list, just one by one, each one of these excuses. You need to know these things. You're going to be dealing with these things. Are you with me right here, guys? And you've got to have deep convictions about it. Why? Because Jesus said that our mission is to seek and save the lost. Amen. If our mission is to seek and save the lost, we better know who's saved and we better know who is lost. Oh, yes. Are you with me right here? Yeah. If you're fuzzy about who's saved and who's lost, how do you know who to share your faith yeah, with? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You've got to have deep convictions about it and the Bible is going to be clear. Amen? Amen. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, the key scripture is verse 21. But we want to take a running start on this and get it in verse 18. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in a body, but made alive by the Spirit, through also he went and preached the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, now he's talking about the ark, in it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Someone says, baptism doesn't save you. And the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.21, very directly, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Now, sometimes people will go, well, hold it, right there, it, baptism is a symbol. It's just a symbol. No, 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 let's go back to the scripture again. What does it say is a symbol? Water. water. It's the water of Noah's time. The flood. He says, you know, back in Noah's time, only eight people were saved. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you're saying so many people are lost. Well, back in Noah's time, only eight people were saved. Wow. How were they saved? By water. In other words, the water killed all the sin in the world. Therefore, these people were uncontaminated and they were saved. You see it? That's the concept. And it says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. You with me right here? Yeah. Right. Now, he says, it's not the removal of dirt from the body. It's not a bath. No, 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 it's not a cleansing. No, 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 no. It's the pledge of a good conscience. Now, if baptism is the pledge of a good conscience, then what must you have before baptism? A bad conscience. A bad conscience. Oh, wow. A bad conscience. You know, one of the things that uh, I always think about when I, when I think about this scripture many, many years ago, uh, my brother and I were throwing the football around in the house. Oh, no. Come on, man. And, I mean, my brother Randy just had a klutzy day. I threw a perfect pass. And he missed it. Now, my mom had these two prized lamps that Dad brought her back from Italy when he was stationed over there. I mean, my mom loved these lamps. They're little fruit lamps. You ever seen those, you know? That's fruity, man. And I throw the pass, goes right through Randy's arms, hits the light, boom, goes down, breaks it about three or four or five pieces. You know, I go, oh, my God, I was so ticked off at Randy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, back in those days, no such thing as super glue. It was just Elmer's. And, and let me put it this way. Elmer's did not get the job done. There was only one thing to do. Hide. <laughs> So, Randy and I, literally, we go up to our room. We're hiding under our beds. 
Mom, mom saying, boys, where are you? She comes up to boys, where are you? We're not saying nothing. <laughs> then finally, she kind of comes up, boys, where are you? And Randy, you know, being the chicken that he is, he, you know, he kind of squirms on out, you know, and everything. And he's crying, you know. Then I start crying, you know. I said, Mom, we didn't mean it. We're derelicts, you know. <laughs> and, you know, amazingly, she forgave us. And when I was under the bed, see, I had a bad conscience. Why? Because I was guilty. Yeah. But then when my mom forgave me, I had a good conscience again. You see, baptism is where you get your sins forgiven. The Bible says, in fact, right here, he says, it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we need to understand that it does say in the scripture, baptism does save you. Amen, guys? We also know in Acts 2.38... That Peter said you got to repent and be baptized to receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The forgiveness of sins is where you get saved. Now, here's a good one. Some people will quote Ephesians 2, verse 8. Let's go over there. Once more, this is an awesome scripture. It says this. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, do you believe this scripture? Yes. Yes. Amen. I hope you do. I hope you do. But people twist this scripture and they say, baptism is a work. But we are saved by faith. Therefore, we don't need to be saved. Let's go back to Colossians 2.12. Remember what Paul says right here. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Here's what people mistake. Baptism is not a work. You're not doing any work. It is an act of faith. I mean, from a human point of view, how does going down in the water give you eternal life? You've done that a few times before in your life, right? Going down in the water? Hopefully. So the only thing that gives you eternal life is your faith that's at work there. Do you see what I'm saying? Remember when Joshua and the Israelites walked around the walls of Jericho? Yeah. They did it once for six days. On the seventh day, they did it seven times. They blew the trumpet, and then the walls came down. Now, if the Israelites had not walked around in the prescribed way, would the walls have fallen? But by walking around, would the walls ordinarily have fallen? No. No. You see, their walking around and then blowing the trumpet was an act of faith. Right. Yeah. That is what baptism is. It is not a work. No. It is an act of faith. It is God working in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. Now, here's another one that sometimes people don't get. Sometimes people say... Well, baptism doesn't save you. All that baptism is, is an outward sign of an inward grace. Now, what they're saying is this. Well, I've been saved already in my heart. Pray Jesus into my heart or whatever. And now, after I've been saved, now I do believe the Bible commands me to be baptized. But it's just the outward sign of something that's already taken place. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Let's go to Romans, chapter 6. In Romans 6, beginning in verse 2, we read, and Paul is talking to all Christians. We died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, absolutely, When we go down in the water and we die with Christ and we are buried, there's a symbolic element of that. And certainly when we come out out of that water, there's a symbolic element of that. But he's saying it's much more than a symbol. This is something that is actually taking place. Because of your faith, you are dying with Christ, 
you're being buried with Christ, you're killing the old self, and you're coming out of that water. And what's it say in verse 4? Raised to a new life. If you're being raised to a new life, what must you have before the water? An old life. You see, baptism is not just a symbol. It is the actual participation by faith in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's required because what forgives us of sin? The blood of Jesus. Amen. When did Jesus forgive us sin? Uh, uh, shed His blood? It was when He died, right? Amen. And so, in order to come in contact with the blood, we have to share in His death. Amen. By actually sharing in His death, we die. That's the only way we die. But we also come in contact with the blood that forgives us of our sins. And so when we come out of that water, we are raised to newness of life. Amen. Is that awesome, guys? Yeah. Amen. Now, here's an interesting thing. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 1, 17. You need to know all these arguments because you will face them. Once more. We got to read the scriptures in context, right, guys? Yep. Come on, Look at verse 17. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So some people will cite this one scripture and say, oh, yeah, baptism isn't important. Christ didn't send me to baptize. That's what Paul said. Well, what do we do? We read it in context. Now, Let's go back up right here to verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Boy, that seems interesting, isn't it? Three very thoughtful questions. I'm thankful I didn't baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. I mean... Baptism was essential for salvation. Paul's purpose was not to individually be the guy that baptizes people. It was to preach the word so people could be saved. But in order to be saved, you have to have faith, you've got to repent, you've got to become a disciple, and you've got to be baptized. And he says, yeah, some of the early people I did baptize, but beyond that, I can't remember anybody else. And so that's why in our church, I don't do very much of the baptizing. I want the members to the baptizing. That's my job as an evangelist, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. We're not a denominational church where you pay me to do your Christianity. Okay? I'm here to help you be the best Christians you can be. Amen, bro. And to be the best Christians you can be is to strive to be fruitful. Amen, guys? Amen. Amen. Now, Here's one of the best ones. You're going to get this one. The thief on the cross was not baptized. And yet Jesus told him that he would see him that day in paradise. Amen? And so people go, well, there you go. Uh, you don't have to be baptized. I mean, Jesus didn't baptize this guy. I mean, they were both on the cross. Go, hold it, hold it, hold it. Let's go back to Romans 6 again. Romans 6, let's be reminded what baptism is. Verse 2 again. We died to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. He's saying right here that baptism is the sharing in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Question number one. With Jesus hanging on the cross... Had he died yet? No. Uh, no. Had he been no. buried yet? No. Had he been resurrected yet? No. So how could you share a New Testament baptism? No. Secondly, you say, well, then, then how could this guy be saved? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Don't forget this one if you would, by chance, have it on the quiz next week. Matthew 9, yeah, you've got to have both of these down. Matthew 9, 2 through 6. Some men brought to him a paralytic lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus says, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins forgiven or get up and walk. 
But so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to give sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up, take up your mat, and go home. And the man went home. Amen? Amen. So Jesus right here has the power to forgive sins. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that special dispensation period during the, the ministry of Jesus. And it's quite an interesting little thing right here. Right. Here's this paralytic, and at first Jesus says, hey, your sin is forgiven. Everybody going, oh, yeah, right, really. So Jesus goes, well, what is easier? Forgiving sins or making this guy walk again? Because, you know, forgive sins is an invisible thing. Yeah. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Supernatural. And there's, you know, so Jesus says, okay, just so that you guys believe, you can walk. And so the guy took up his mat and he walked. And, of wow. course, the point being that not only could he make the guy walk, but he could forgive sins, right? right. So the thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized yeah. because Jesus forgave him of his sins personally, right? right? And it was before the New Testament period actually begins there in Acts 2 where baptism is the sharing in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Finally, the believer's baptism is very similar to what we talked about a little bit earlier, that you have an outward sign of an inward grace. A believer's baptism is in many community-type churches where they, once more, say you're saved when you pray Jesus into your heart. And then, because you're a believer, and the Bible says, and commands baptism, then you are baptized. Mm. But in fact, the Bible teaches quite clearly, and you know the Scriptures, Acts 2.38, that's where sin is forgiven at baptism, right? right. And John 3.5, he says, okay... You're not going to see the kingdom of God unless you are born of the water and the Spirit. Amen? So these are most of the arguments that you're going to find against true New Testament conversion. So, next Wednesday is family night. Amen, guys? So you've got to think of something cool to give everybody in your group. Next Wednesday, you're going to know all the books in the Bible. Next Wednesday, you're going to have all those scriptures memorized. You're going to know all the major conversions in the book of Acts. And you're going to be able to be able to explain to people why you need to be baptized to have your sins forgiven. Amen? If you have any questions, come and see me afterwards. Thanks. God bless.